It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. Today's episode, I'm going to say something I've never said before. There may actually be circumstances, don't shoot me, where it's cheaper to eat out than to eat at home, cook at home. Yes. You excited about that, Krista? Yes. I've been waiting to hear you say this for 25 years. That's awesome. Well, it's only it's only in a narrow I know. situation. Uh, another thing, um, airline seat sizes. They're getting smaller and smaller. There are several airlines, uh, American on a lot of its planes, uh, Frontier, Spirit, Allegiant, 28 inches pitch. That's the space between rows from the back of one to the back of another. I mean, it's tight, right? Should the government get involved? The government right now is taking your suggestions, your comments on whether or not the Fed should regulate the space you have on an airplane. I'm going to talk about that in a little while. So I excited you saying eating out. Maybe. So who's doing really well right now in the restaurant business? Do you know... There are two companies in particular that Wall Street's been really thrilled with lately. McDonald's Mm -hmm. and Chipotle. Both of them have been doing really, really well. People perceive that they're getting real value for every hard-earned dollar they spend on a meal. And this year has been really, really hard for traditional supermarkets. Supermarket inflation has been much, much higher than restaurant inflation. And traditional supermarkets, uh, mostly regional supermarket chains and Kroger, the big national chain, I mean, they've really been getting squeezed by the marketplace. They've got uh, so many SKUs, so many different items they have in the stores and all that. And they're in a position where supermarkets, it may shock you, but they operate on very low Net profits, very low for the amount of sales that go through their doors. They don't make a lot of money. And so these price increases that have come in in so many categories in the supermarket, they have no choice either. They either become a money-losing operation or they increase their prices. And so their prices have gone up by enormous amounts. Um One estimate I saw, shockingly, says that the cost of groceries over the last year have gone up 13%. 13%. Lots of factors involved in that. Drought in a lot of areas of the world where we grow food of all different kinds. And then general price inflation, the brand name product manufacturers shoving prices higher and higher, um, where restaurant meals have gone up and cost basically half that. So one person feeding himself or herself, maybe a couple, if you're uh, really careful with where you go and what you spend eating out, gosh, it's... It could be at a point that you don't have to feel guilty you're eating out. You know what you haven't mentioned in a while? Your Bermuda Triangle of the restaurant menu. Yes. Uh, Well, alcohol, appetizers, dessert. Yeah. Dessert is the most profitable thing a lot of restaurants do. The cost for them, for a lot of the desserts they sell, uh, under a quarter. And they sell desserts depending on the price point of the restaurant. It can be more than $10 for that dessert that they've got a quarter in. Um, okay, you're a gourmet restaurant. Maybe you got 50 cents in that dessert. Uh, so uh, the, obviously, everybody knows alcohol has a huge markup. And uh, so the entree is the one thing at a restaurant that doesn't have huge markups typically. And... Think about it. Let's go to my level of restaurant, fast food. What do I never order at a fast food restaurant? Fries. Fries. That's the one thing I want to order. Yeah, I don't <laughs> eat French fries. I, I'm not. I don't really like French fries, so I'm able to 
think about how much money I'm saving. So that's an ultra high profit margin item for the, the fast foodies. And I don't even like them. So wow. I don't have to spend that money. But the, the couponing, not as frequent as it was. Where's the money saved now at mid-price, lower price, and fast food restaurants, quick serve and fast food? I don't know. Oh, yeah, you do. I do? Maybe I didn't oh, state the like question Like soft well. drinks and stuff? Oh, 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 okay. Using your smartphone app, right? Yep. Ordering with the app, getting the, the rewards. Yes. I mean, it's unreal how much money you save when you're eating out when you use the app. Because, see, let me tell you what's in it for the restaurant. What, what, fast food all the way to mid-price. When you use the app, they know that you are a more committed diner and you're likely to go more often and then they're dangling the points at you and all that and so if you use the restaurant apps it's shocking how much you can save and sometimes I feel like they should pay me not to come in <laughs> when I'm using one of the apps so we're just in an odd odd spot right now where I'm not saying go out and eat out all the time because remember the the big difference is the food you buy at a supermarket has a generally low markup. The food cost of a restaurant is only part of their cost because they have the whole operation, the labor costs, everything involved in running the restaurant. Uh, but right now, there is a compression that if you're good with how you shop for a restaurant meal, you actually could find that particularly for an individual or two, that it's cost effective to eat out a lot of times than it is to cook at home. All right. Well, speaking of food, this is from Lisa in Connecticut. When discussing ways for people to save money, especially in this inflationary environment, why does whole food plant-based not come up? I'm happy to provide many, many doctors. Does that mean names. like Impossible Burger and Beyond? Is that what that well, means? Well, whole food is usually like actual like produce, like real whole foods that come as nature. And plant oh, based. Oh, plant based oh, means oh, it's oh. based on plants. I'm happy to provide many, many doctors' names who can help educate your listeners. Fruits and vegetables, we're talking here. Sure. Okay. And beans and other things, like all that stuff. Nuts, all the berry, stuff you all eat. those things. Yeah. So this post was not it from was Lisa not from in me. Connecticut. This is you using her name as a pseudonym for you no and she links to an article and says as you can see the reduction in risk is staggering i'm confident no cheap food will make up for costs associated with disease and you agree with this one completely you were you were really upset about how i eat no you know what you are i upset. used to say more no honestly i feel like it's your life people can do what they want like i don't it's none of my business what you or anyone else puts in their body i just have to focus on what i do you know all right everybody's so, different uh lisa what you say scientifically and medically is proven that how you eat directly affects your overall health how you how active you are, inactive you are, totally affects your health. And there was a, a thing I read about this big scientific debate of medical and scientific researchers, um, which was more important, exercise or how you eat. And the article's conclusion was exercise a little bit, but really both are what matter, that the combination yeah. of it. So Lisa... You're right. My wife appreciates you writing this as well because my wife wishes that I ate better than I do. All right. I'm not going to say this person's name, even though she gave it because it's unique and because of the nature of the question. Okay. Um, someone in Florida says, Clark, I'm 25 years old. I have a master's degree and I'm currently in a job I do not enjoy. I feel underpaid and overworked compared to my peers in similar roles. Most of the leadership team has changed since I started in February, which has changed my role and growth opportunities significantly. I've only been at this job for six months, but I'm considering looking for something I will truly be excited about. Is it too early to make the switch? So this is funny. If you asked me this question in 2019, I would have said too early to make a switch. 
the mentality of workers in the employment world has changed so much post-COVID versus pre-COVID, and particularly in your 20s. If you're in a job that you hate, it's not working for you, there's no advancement you see in front of you, you go find something else and go. Would this, you agree with that? I would, yes. And, and Especially at 25, you know, you want to get into a career that you that you have a passion for. Right. It, cause, and also, you're given a bit of a, if you know the golfing expression, you're given a mulligan when you're in your 20s. Mm-hmm. So you go somewhere and you're like, hmm, that wasn't, that wasn't really the best. Uh, you can make a change and it won't be held against you. At the same time, six months into a job, in your 40s or 50s and you bolt that doesn't look the same as it does when you're in your 20s plus you often have more obligations at that point it's more nerve-wracking that is true um this is from jeanette also in florida my partner and i were not married are planning to purchase a home on the west coast of florida this year we plan to submit a down payment of a hundred thousand dollars each and share the cost of the mortgage payment equally we want to know the best way to have the deed to the property read as we are each equal in the purchase. We are concerned about the best way also to leave our portion of the investment to our heirs if our partner dies. What do you suggest? All right, Jeanette, you add uh, significant potential complications by buying a home with a partner with which you don't have the benefit of marriage. So before you go through this, before you even uh, try to make a non- uh, a non-lawyer's decision about a legal matter, this is one I want you to go seek out a real estate attorney in Florida. If you've never used one, ask somebody at work who's bought a home in the state of Florida who the real estate closing attorney was they used. Did they like that individual, uh, feel like they knew what they were doing? Go meet with that individual. and The two of you should go together and have the lawyer talk through proper titling of the purchase of that property. Because it's one of those things that it's a lot better to do it right up front than to later say, oops, we shouldn't have done it that way. You stated several goals you have. You state those same goals to that lawyer. You're not going to spend a lot of money. It's not a lot of clock time involved in this conversation. But the benefit down the road to have it work like you want in the ownership with your partner is going to bring a lot of peace of mind to you. And something that people are really fired up about is when they walk on an airplane and they get in a seat in crunch class. And we're going to talk about the feds considering regulating the size of a seat and the leg room you have on an airplane. I'm going to tell you my opinion on the feds getting into this issue of private industry. So a lot of complaints about the travel industry. This has been a rough, rough year for the airline industry with flight delays, cancellations. I mean, it's really roulette when you get to the airport. Is your plane going to go at all? And how close to schedule is it going to go? And let me tell you, you're not just in misery. The airline employees who work at the airport, ticket counter, gate agents, um, flight attendants, pilots, mechanics, wing walkers, everybody is suffering from the mistakes that airline management made at all the nation's airlines as a result of what happened with COVID in March of 20. And none of them have recovered from it. It's been really, really awful. And so we're all in this misery together. But one part of the misery that is mainly borne by the passengers and the flight attendants is how people are being crowded on airplanes like you can't believe. And if you've been on some of the newest airplanes, some of the airlines have made a very interesting choice of making the toilets so tiny that anybody, as they refer to them now in the airline industry, passengers of size, anybody who's not a stick figure 
can't really fit in these bathrooms. They are so extremely tiny. And then you got the seats. So you got the leg room shrinking. You got the seat width that's terrible. A lot of the Boeing aircraft only have a seat width of 17 inches. Now, Americans are quite a bit bigger than we used to be. We are taller and bigger, and the seats have gotten smaller, and the space has gotten smaller. So there's been this backlash with the public against airlines shrinking and shrinking and shrinking the space. And now there's a comment period open with the feds. The FAA wants to know if you think the FAA should issue regulations that would control how much space you have. Okay, so my thing, as long as an airline can demonstrate that everybody can evacuate safely in the mandated time, which I think is 90 seconds in the event of an emergency, I'm fine with letting the airlines allocate the space inside a plane however they want. And I'm even a fan of the Ryanair proposal from the Irish airline of having a standee section on flights up to 90 minutes that you could buy an even cheaper fare if you were willing to stand. I love to stand anyway. So if I could stand for 90 minutes and get the cheapest possible fare, I'd be all over that. And I'm not kidding, actually. So people choose to fly airlines that have these very tight rows. Why? Because of the price. You start having the government get in and mandate, you lose a lot of innovation, too. I mean, there's stuff coming in the airline industry, uh, not seen it in the United States, but like Air New Zealand is coming up with a lie-flat bed in coach, really innovative design. And there are things coming, including there are going to be potentially in the future bunk beds on airplanes. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that designers are coming up with that's very safe because these seats have to meet uh, safety requirements first. And you allow the industry to innovate. I mean, you look what's happening with the more and more classes of seats. You've got the basic economy, then you've got economy, then you've got the, uh, the economy where they give you a little more leg room that each airline calls its own thing. And then there might be a premium economy, which is a wider seat with more leg room. And then there might be uh, first class or business class or whatever. Planes are being segmented into all these different compartments. And what's funny when you fly the full fare airlines is how many different boarding groups they have. Like they got like 14 boarding groups you know, these days. And so if you're this, this, this status, you board now. If you're first class, you board. And if you're, um, I don't know. I mean, they've got all these different things. If you have their credit card, you're a boarding group. And what boarding group number are you usually in? Because you're a big shot oh, with yeah. one of the No, you three, think you're a big airlines. shot and you have a good boarding group and then you're like the 10th one to go <laughs> it's hilarious group. i love that they always board the military first active duty military and then families with kids have to board you know there's just a lot of a lot of groups for sure i remember um i was on a flight once on uh one of the full fare airlines and i'd bought the basic economy because it was just so cheap <laughs> and so the gate agent calls Group after group after group after group, and never calls for basic economy. And so I realize I'm the only one left at the gate. It's like that movie Meet the Parents. Meet the parents. Was it? Oh my God. With gosh. the guys standing there, the Hilarious. only person at the gate. Yes. And so I go forward and I said, um, You haven't called my group yet. She said, What group are you? <laughs> I said, uh, Basic economy. She's, oh, oh, okay, you can board. Wow. I was the only person. I have a picture of it. Oh, my gosh. That's hilarious. I have a picture of me being the only person at this big airline gate. We should post we, that well, picture. Well, you probably didn't we? have to wait on the uh, the jetway. jetway. No. I walked onto the plane, and everybody's like, so now we can go? <laughs> Finally, the last person's on the plane. But I figure if I hadn't said anything, 
she was going to close the door and that plane was going without me. My gosh, it's so funny. But anyway, as far as the seat thing, I don't want the government involved in it because I believe that innovation is going to win the day. There's an airline I never talk about that's one of the startups called Breeze, Breeze Airways. They're doing so much innovative stuff and... Um, don't don't now post about well I booked a breeze flight and this happened or that happened. but they're they're a very innovative carrier they're doing a lot of cool things with the seats and um, I love letting the entrepreneurs come up with the answer and by the way do you think that the airline's going to sell that awful basic economy seat that I bought if there wasn't somebody dumb enough like me who would buy it right? And why did I buy it? Because it was the cheapest fare. And that day I didn't have to take a bag. I was traveling with just a backpack. And it worked out Oh, you're me. standing there with your little backpack and your ticket and just waiting for someone to call your name. <laughs> That's hilarious. But I didn't get left. I didn't get left. I, you know, the meek do not inherit no. the airport. I went forward and said, excuse me, ma'am, is it my turn no. to board? <laughs> but um, I... I want them to make sure that it's safe for us to get off the plane. Yeah. That is what I care about. Other than that. All right. Well, um, I've got a question here from Daniel in Michigan about cruising. We go cruising often with my father-in-law who lost his wife a few years oh, ago. I'm sorry. The problem is that he always has to pay basically for two people because he's taking up a full room. Do you have any suggestions of what he can do for future cruises? There is no option of him rooming with us or even another person he does not really know. Oh, I don't know. Some cruise ships are pretty wild. Maybe he should. Oh, my gosh. Sorry. Shouldn't have said that. Uh, anyway, Daniel. <laughs> okay. So Norwegian Cruise Line, NCL has long had a thing where you can buy a single traveler cabin. And so you're not paying double the freight. It's a smaller cabin, but it's built for one. And there's more going on. Speaking of innovation, there's more going on in this space with the cruise industry where you don't have to pay double the freight for an individual going. What I recommend is find an experienced cruise-only agent at a cruise-only agency or at a traditional travel agency that has a cruise department, and they'll be able to tell you, Daniel, which cruise lines besides NCL have these cabins that are designed for and they don't mark up for an individual traveler. All right, put your landscaping hat on. This one's from Michelle in Me? Florida. I know. I recently resodded my yard. What are your thoughts on paying a professional a monthly service to treat the yard for bugs, fungus, etc.? Is it just as well to do this myself? I want to protect my investment, and I welcome your thoughts. So, Michelle, um, you live in Florida. It's very common in Florida that people buy do-it-yourself pest control systems. But a lot of people who start doing it don't stick with it because it's, it's not the uh, most fun job in the world, but it's, but it's very common in Florida. If you go into a hardware store, you go into a chain like Home Depot or Lowe's, you'll find the stuff to do the chemical applications yourself to your yard. But most people do end up hiring one of the services. I figure you could... Try it yourself, and then if you don't like it, uh, you go ahead and hire a company to do it. But it is something that if you if you uh, read online about the proper applications and all that, you can buy the stuff and do it. One thing I have noticed is that a lot of the professionals who do the applications to the yards are wearing protective face gear. Yeah. I never see a consumer doing his or her own yard who's wearing protective face gear. Gloves, and, too. Huh? Gloves, too. If you're yeah, getting chemicals. So, so I would be mindful of that and make sure you're protecting yourself as well as protecting your yard. 
And this is from Glenna. I just want to make sure that you get some positive feedback on your awesome team. I recently called for advice on how to collect a small claims judgment. After canceling, rescheduling twice, then finally canceling reservations, this was over three years, always due to COVID for our family reunion, we were awarded our $6,800 judgment. We thought the hard part was over until we came to how to collect the judgment. Your team helped us with wording a letter to the defendant that conveyed our serious intent to invoke a number of rem remedies. We informed the defendant that we expected a resolution within 30 days of the judgment date. We are overjoyed to report that we received the full amount on the 28th day. This is such a relief to our entire family. Each member of our family is currently receiving their share, which hopefully will help cover their next tank of gas. Well, $6,800 hopefully covers well, it was 30 more. people, I guess. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but so we, we do actually have our center director for Team Clark is a is a lawyer and we don't give explicit legal advice but we do have information on what you do the administrative procedures on how you can collect a judgment after you have one because from tv you'd think if you win a case in small claims court that it's all over at that point and you're happily ever after and you walk out with your money uh all you have is what collection attorneys refer to as a license to hunt with that judgment. And a lot of people who you get a judgment against just ignore it. But there are things you can do. There's uh, equipment you can take. You might be able to take their vehicle. Um, you may be able to put a lien against property they own. There's steps you can take that actually, uh, in many states, a non-lawyer can do if you know how to do them. So just want you to know that getting the judgment is the first part. Then the real work begins to walk away with that money. And I'm so glad that we were able to help you, Glenna, and get your money in 28 days. And that, if you want to contact our team, it's clark.com slash CAC. You'll see all the information. So we provide free one-on-one -on -one guidance and advice. 30 hours each week, and you'll see all the scoop on that if you go to clark.com slash CAC. So I want to tell you that's it for today's episode. If you haven't checked out clark.com recently, I hope you will. We have news and updates. We have the guides for you to make smart decisions with various things that are like a lot of noise in our lives, and we don't know exactly how to get the most value out of our wallet. We help you with that. Um, some of the recent articles we published just quite recently, seven of the best free and cheap resume builders. If you're looking for new work. Longevity insurance. What is it? Do you need it? How to minimize the damage of unpaid bills to your credit score. 12 things you never knew you could get from your local library. And how to save money 35 ways to reduce expenses. Those are just five examples of the kind of content we post on Clark.com every day is we are here for one purpose, one purpose only, and that's to serve you.